I welcome everybody to uh, what's a new format for us in terms of engaging and uh, chatting about ESET tests and uh, a bit of a frustration not to be able to get out and do face to face things, but we'll see how we go. We just thought it would be a great opportunity to do a bit of a rundown on some of the things that have happened this year. So we've got together Hugh Bryan, Zaritza Durick from New South Wales DPI and Lisa Kelly, pathologist with DAF in Toowoomba, to go through things that have happened uh, over the last summer, which was a particularly busy summer, and to, I guess, think also about some of the things that might be uh, in store for winter cropping. So uh, we might get Hugh to take it away. Thank you, Hugh. Radio, uh, welcome all. I thought I'd go through the uh, pestilences that hit summer pulses this summer it was quite a year my phone didn't stop running so i thought i'd put them all up and, and try and generate some discussion and questions so some of the key issues uh there's a late start in many regions uh but there were large numbers of many pests that may have been because when the drought breaks you get a profusion of their hosts and they get a start jump on their uh, beneficials some people panicked and were spraying below threshold pests which we don't really want Disease and stem fly were uh, thought to be maybe linked in the vertigan, but as uh, Lisa will be saying, we think it's mostly due to uh, her discipline to the uh, pathology and the diseases. Fall armyworm has been in the northern uh, pulse growing regions, but we haven't had any uh, reports of major damage to pulse crops. It's been mainly in maize and some in sorghum. Helicoverpa resistance management has been flagged by many uh, consultants and growers as an ongoing key issue. And the resistance challenge with Healy's is there because we don't have a fourth uh, group, the Success Neo. There have been emergency permits put forward for fall army worm. That's going to just extend the selection pressure on Healy's because uh, there are a lot of Healy's in May this year. We did have major outbreaks of some of the other other caterpillars too, and their presence puts extra pressure on Helicoverpa. We had cluster caterpillars, soybean moth and bean pod borer, uh, particularly in the tropical uh, soybeans. And in the tropics, the vertigan is becoming a key pulse production area for summer pulses purely because it's got a lot of water and they can grow crops all year round. So with the drought, there's a lot of pressure on growers to have multiple crops and the pests just love that. So that's an issue that will have to be looked at in the future. Also in the uh, tropics, you get very lush soybeans, dense canopy and coverage can be an issue, uh, especially with aerial application. And the very high pest activity was a lot in CQ, a lot of uh, thrips activity causing severe distortion of the plants. And you can see the uh, this plant here, I haven't thrown it in the air, I actually painted out the hand that was holding it there. But you can see that severe distortion of the leaves. Some crops uh, next to Parthenium weed had bad tobacco streak virus. In an area like that, possibly cultural control of your surrounding the thrip habitat would be, would be the way to go. With the fall army worm, everyone, a lot of people were imagining they had them or wanted to be the first to have them, or we had a lot of reports of cluster caterpillar. People sent me photos. You can see that one on the left there. And that is, uh, if you've seen both of them together, that's very obviously a cluster caterpillar. So that's a Spadoptera species already here. Coastal pest does feed on pulse crops. Uh, very high numbers this summer, but it reinforced the fact that this is in soybeans anyway, is mainly a leaf feeder. So very high leaf damage, but not damage to pods, uh, except in a late crop. There were very high numbers late in the crop as the leaves were senescing and a lot of the larvae switched their attention from those dying leaves to the pods, but that was the exception rather than the rule. Soybean stem fly, so that's been a sporadic pest, but can cause significant damage. There have been reports in the tropics, 2006, Mackay, 2013, quite severe damage near Casino, but in other years, uh, less damaging. And in the Burdekin, uh, we think that the numbers weren't high enough to cause the uh, sudden plant death syndromes that we saw, and Lisa will be talking more about that. In the tropics and the coastal areas, we do get pests that we don't get in mung beans in the more traditional inland areas west of the divide, or in uh, more inland central Queensland, and the pest in question is bean fly. 
they have had quite severe damage in the burdekin, um, which means they have had to put dimethoate on as a soft option. Other potential options would be uh, seed treatments, but they would be neonicotinoids, uh, which we probably don't want in the reef catchment area. And pod tucking bugs have been a perennial problem in the tropics and, and coastal crops. In those areas, they do a greater proportion of the species of the red banded shield bug. Uh, though in this year on the downs, we did have also some of those, but also brown shield bug. These things uh, share a common feature in that they are very hard, if not impossible, to control the delta methrin. They are in effect resistant to it. If we add some salt, we get at best moderate control, about 60%. We do have permits in for shield that are current, and to be most effective, it probably needs a max effectant. They've got a 20 one day withholding period, there would be a real crisis if the shield being a neonic or neonics in general were withdrawn from use. Yeah, with the very high pressure of pot sucking bugs and the vertican in particular, growers had difficulty in keeping the population below threshold. They still were the prices for the commodities, they were getting good prices. However, what was of concern that some new growers were being taken advantage of. Some crops were sprayed way too early in the flowering period and you're not going to get damaged then because you don't have any pods to damage. Other issue too that needs to be resolved would be the continuous cropping in the vertican. So in a long term, that will prove to be problematic because you're breeding up your pests uh, all year round. Whereas in the southern areas, on the downs, on the burnet, uh, with the frosts we're likely to get this winter, that will... Uh, put a stop to that uh, breeding. There were some minor sporadic pests, uh, beet webworm was one. That one came into uh, play, I think largely because there was a profusion of its weed host, black pigweed, and there was a lot of black pigweed in some of the mung bean crops. So the moths, of course, were flying there and maybe feeding on the mung bean flowers, but we saw very few, if any, of the beet webworm larva in the uh, flowers or pods. What we did see was numbers of the bean pod borer there, the distinctive caterpillars. So new growers in particular in the tropical regions need to be make aware of the difference between the two, not spray for the beet web boom, but be very much aware of, of the presence of uh, bean pod borer. Last major pest issue, uh, loosened crown borer has been sporadic, but high numbers in some crops can slash your soybean yields by 50%, and that's due to larval tunneling in the stem. That's not damaging per se, but when they overwinter, they ring bark the plant internally, sever the vascular tissue in the plant above their dies, and can often snap off. So this was a non-desiccated crop, Coranda was the cultivar in the vertican, the same variety with a desiccation spray that rapidly that induces rapid dry down of the crop and the beetle larva thinks the crop's going to go into harvest mode i better pupate quickly and they do that in the taproot but they seal that pith canal uh, with macerated uh, vascular tissue there so the way around that is to if you're planting in that region make sure you've got a very good even and uniform plant stand that'll hold it, hold the other plants up and not fall over all over the place in conclusion, there are challenging issues ahead, helicoverper resistance. We have fall armyworm, uh, and that will play into the resistance management strategy. Uh, ongoing, we will need smarter pest management, and particularly when we're dealing with a multitude of pests and summer pulses, the pod sucking bugs and the more tropical pests. So we don't really want to go gung-ho with our, our spraying. So I'll leave it there. So hopefully this generated some questions and comments. There was a question that came in at registration that's probably one for you, which is that there was consistent mirrored presence in mung beans, but very little evidence of damage in some of the later crops. Is that typical? So that could happen. I, you might have had uh, continual mirrored pressure, but they might have been low mirrored numbers. Alternatively, there might have been damage there, but without a with and without spray comparison, it's very hard to tell because myriads are not causing damage like here leads do with damage to the pods where you see chewed pods that's readily visible or chewed leaves. They can cause a reduction in pod set, but uh, if the slowest numbers, the, the difference that's made to your crop won't be readily apparent. Okay, now I've broken the ice with that question. Is there anybody else who has a question? Uh, Melina Hugh Ridden smith here. Just wondered with that crown borer, you're talking about the damage in soybeans, what about in mung beans? Because we did see more of them this season. Uh, the 
the good news is it does not damage mung beans. We'll get into pigeon pea, we'll get into uh, soybeans, but not mung beans. Good, thank you. So there's another question here, here that you can probably uh, respond to now, given that you spoke a little bit about, you know, the, the severe pressure you had in some instances, and you made reference to big webworm and the proliferation of black pigweed. There's a question here that says, uh, pest pressure seem to build up very quickly, considering the drought. Are the insects developing different adaptations given the variable weather patterns? What uh, do you think was the explanation for, yeah. you know, how quickly they built up and how many there were? What they're doing is behaving true to form and we often see pest outbreaks after severe droughts. You get the rain, there's a profusion of their host plants uh, and they get the jump on the beneficials because the lower the density of the pest during the drought period, the harder it is for the beneficials to find them. So we've seen that for numerous pests uh, in previous uh, drought breaking years, we've had massive outbreaks of army worms. This year we had stupendous numbers of moths that fed on iron barks in the forest country around Kingaroy, and they were feeding on the new succulent growth and they got the jump on the predators and parasites that normally keep them in check. So it's a very common phenomenon to get major pest outbreaks following the uh, breaking of a drought. So the next presenter is uh, Zaritza Jurek, who is uh, the entomologist with New South Wales DPI based in uh, Tamworth. And uh, I guess a relatively new appointment. It's been a long time since there's been an entomologist in New South Wales. Zaritza is uh, involved in work with brush and weed aphid and with Yacht Van Leur in uh, the aphid as vectors project. And I think she will talk about those things and more. Okay, so I will speak um, a little bit about aphid update uh, in Northern region. So, uh, so far, we are monitoring aphids in different uh, crops, uh, mainly in pulse crops. Monitoring aphids uh, and uh, early detection of uh, crop aphids uh, is actually uh, key to effective management. Aphids can be very destructive uh, crop pests as they can damage crop plants directly through feeding damages, through secretion of their honeydew, and also they can cause uh, indirect crop damage through the transmission of plant viruses. In order to support profitable cropping, there is a need to understand the virus vector epidemiology, also aphid biology, movement, and behavior. Virus incidents vary greatly between years and locations. Uh, losses caused by viruses depend on virus uh, species and also on the time of infection. And they can vary between uh, very low, so less than 5%, up to totally crop failure. Chickpeas are rarely colonized by uh, aphids because of high level of oxalic and malic acids that inhibit aphid. However, because of relative unattractiveness of uh, chickpea leaves, migratory aphids uh, actually might move even faster between chickpea plants, which would result in substantially higher infection and infestation incidence. Aphid population growth very much depends on seasonal issues and uh, it's actually strongly influenced by local environment factors. And the key, key question is, uh, is it necessary to control aphids to avoid yield losses? To support the answer, here are some results of monitoring aphids in northern region that we conducted uh, in last few years. So 2017 was a very dry summer season and during winter dry condition continued as well. Although the generally during the spring time, uh, it was actually uh, favorable conditions for aphid multiplication, still very low aphid movement was noticed, as you can see from this slide. Aphid movement in uh, 2018 was even lower comparing to 2017 because of dry conditions that uh, actually continued. And even though it was generally very low aphid movement, it was uh, under 150 aphids per square meter per day, actually because of mild autumn condition, cowpea aphid was detected and its population built quickly in observed faba bean crop. The dense colonies cause direct uh, damages together with the production of honeydew, as you can see from these pictures. Results from 2019, as you can see, aphid movement was really high comparing to 2017 and 18, but uh, only one major peak was observed, and that was in period from July to September. 
After that pe period, aphid numbers declined as crop matured earlier due to, uh, again, extreme drought conditions. And at the same time, population of beneficials increased, including lady beetles, uh, as you can see from this picture, but also lace wings, hoverflies, and parasitic wasps. At the moment, uh, we are monitoring aphids in uh, lucerne crop, and this is the newest results. As you can see from this graph, population is dropping down. Two main peaks were observed depending on the environmental conditions, and different aphid species were recorded, with the main aphid uh, being cowpea aphid, spotted alpha alpha aphid, cotton aphid, green peach aphid, and oat aphid. Cowpea aphid infestation was also reported in fava bean crop in Murray district of New South Wales. And during the inspection, high activity of beneficials was also noticed. So as you can see from this picture, there are parasitized aphid on fava bean leaves and also predatory species like lady beetles, among the others. We were thinking what would be the best uh, approach uh, with this early infestation of faba big crop with cowpea aphid, since we expected that cooler temperature would have a significant impact on reducing aphid population. We decide not to use any chemical control, as most insecticides would uh, destroy beneficial insects along with the pests. To conclude this story on aphid population dynamics, I would like to say that aphid numbers are affected by environmental conditions, but also crop development, aphid biology, and population of natural enemies. So decision on controlling aphids has to have an integrated approach of all mentioned factors. One thing I would like to mention at the end of story with the aphids in pulse crops, this is picture of faba bean aphid or Megura crassicauda. Uh, this aphid has been found in parts of northern east and central New South Wales in faba bean crop and that was in uh, 2017. It is large aphid with bright green body and dark head and legs and uh, easy recognizable intensive red eyes. It has an ability to create large colonies on faba bean plants in just a few days. And uh, our ob observations during winter season 2018 and 19 did not show any presence of this aphid. So I would like to ask all of you, uh, if you have a uh, faba bean crop, please report if you have any suspicious aphids in your crop and contact uh, New South Wales DPI or Queensland entomologist so that we can do confirmation and identification of your suspicious aphids. Next thing that uh, I would like to speak about is Russian with aphids. Russian with aphid is firstly identified in South Australia in 2016. In 2016 uh, and 17, infestation stretched into Victoria, Southern New South Wales, and Tasmania. In um, late 2018, the first detections were in north of Dubbo, uh, Liverpool Plains, and Coonabarabran area. To date, Tamworth is the northern site where Russian with aphids has been confirmed. And of course, there is no Russian with aphid in Queensland. And uh, also, I need to mention that we didn't have any positives so far in 2020. How to identify Russian with aphid? So Russian with aphid is pale green spindle-shaped aphid. Cornicles, sifunculus, are very short, as you can see from this picture, and they are almost invisible. Also, the most important identification character is supercaudal process, which gives appearance of this aphid having like a two tails, which is actually character that you can actually easy identify this aphid and distinguish from all other serial aphid species. Russian with aphid host range is as follows, barley, wheat, and durum wheat. Oats are resistant to Russian with aphid, and triticale is moderately resistant, according to internet source. Internationally, there are no evidence of Russian with aphid being passed in sorghum or mice. However, at the Tamworth Agricultural Institute, we are conducting a research on role of sorghum might play in maintaining a Russian with aphid population over summer and also on a level of potential damages uh, of Russian with aphid in sorghum. Results uh, regarding these research uh, will be published next season, very much likely. The main host plants on which a larger population of Russian with aphid 
could be are actually winter, winter cereals, barley grass, prairie grass, bromus species, and Johnson grass. So far, we had the positives in voluntary winter cereals and barley grass. If you think that you have any problems with this aphid in your crops, firstly, you have to know that crops can be infested under warmer condition. Uh, usually that's in uh, autumn or early in spring. Firstly, the stressed areas in paddocks will be infested, so they need to be firstly inspected. Russian weed aphid can be found uh, usually on younger leaves, uh, which have to be unrolled to be inspected. Leaves uh, infested with Russian weed aphid uh, usually have long, white, yellowish, or rarely purple stripes. And these symptoms appear because of saliva of this aphid, which is toxic to the plant. Growers should firstly inspect inside of rolled leaves and newest leaves uh, needs to be inspected for aphid infestation. This aphid is manageable. That's the most uh, important for you to know. And in recent years, uh, conducted trials uh, by Sardi team, they reported that very little or no yield losses occurred when Russian weed aphid were controlled before GS40. Existing economic thresholds for aphids in general, so for uh, cereal aphids, are 90% of plants infested uh, or less than two predators per plant present, then you have to spray your crop, or if you have more than 10 to 15 aphids per tiller. Sardi conducted research on establishing thresholds suitable for Australian agriculture. Until uh, this work is concluded, the U.S. thresholds are recommended, which are if more than 20% of plants are infested before GS32 or after GS32, more than 10% of tillers infested. If you need to apply insecticide, select the softest option. Prophylactic foliar treatments are discouraged as they can affect beneficials. Be aware that Russian weed aphids are strongly regulated by environmental conditions and they prefer relatively warmer, drier climates. And the heavy rainfall are reported that they can cause 50% of mortality of one colony. Also, natural enemies could limit the abundance of the Russian weed aphid, which actually I witnessed in Kunabarabran and Bandela site. So natural enemies can definitely limit the population of Russian weed aphid and bring a low level of Russian weed aphid could actually have uh, more uh, losses than benefits from it. If you spot any suspicious aphids in your crop, uh, you should firstly look for symptoms, then check areas that are actually under stress and inspect it so that you unroll the leaves uh, or tillers because aphids are hiding usually inside of the rolled leaves. And if you are suspicious and uh, you are unable to do identification, please report it to DAF entomologist or call DAF Hall Center. Phone number is uh, on screen. All right, thank you very much, Zaritza. Are there any questions for Zaritza? Go ahead, Kim. It's more of a comment than a question, just reinforcing that because Russian weed aphid hasn't been found in Queensland, we kind of need somebody to find it and report it so that we can tick off on the um, extension to geographical range. So if somebody does find it in Queensland, can they please report it? So far, the northest point is Tamworth, as I mentioned. And uh, actually, this season, we uh, were inspecting also the paddocks where actually we found uh, last year, positives from last year. We couldn't find it this year. So I wouldn't expect it with this winter season. So maybe not even next spring because of very low number in areas where Russian weed aphid so far is established. There was a question uh, sent in earlier about um, favour beans while we're talking about winter crops, I guess. And it was a question about myriads in favour beans. And I know, Zaritza, that when you went to Moree, you did see myriads in the favour beans. And the question is about whether myriads will cause tipping out in young favour bean crops. And also whether there's any implication of having myriads in the crop now that might pose a greater risk to the favour beans when they're starting to put on pods when we know that they can actually cause damage. Did you, Zaritza, want to say something about, you know, what you saw just quickly in Moree? 
definitely uh, mirrors were present in Mori when I was doing inspection of fava bean crop. But tipping wasn't like very wide a symptom in uh, crop. I couldn't spot it the usually damages that mirrors could uh, cause, no any symptoms present. So I wouldn't say that they could cause damages like tipping. Uh, usually they could be a problem at the podding growth stage. There is a question about aphids that's come in, which is it's a, whether seed dressings are useful and if there are any registered to manage virus transmission early. Seed dressing would be useful, but for a very short time, like uh, just after crop emerged. After that, the efficacy of uh, seed dressing is uh, lost. So that lasts for a very short time at the beginning of winter season with the early sown crops. So does that mean that even if you used a seed treatment, that the potential benefit in terms of limiting virus is fairly limited? Aphids can transmit virus even if they feed. So they will maybe end up being dead after they feed on that plant, but still they can transmit virus. So that's pretty much questionable. I'll just finish off on the question about myriads in favour beans. The question about tipping out, I think Zaritza sort of partially answered in that it wasn't apparent in the crop. And I guess whilst we'd imagine from our experience in cotton that that's entirely possible, I don't think that there's any experience with that. It's certainly not something that I've heard reported previously. And in terms of myriad persisting in favour beans, what we do know about myriads is that the population probably declines quite considerably if, if the winter is cold in particular. We know that females go into a reproductive diapause so that the population won't grow as a result of reproduction over winter. And it's much more likely, I think, that you will get myriads in a favour bean crop in spring as a result of immigration rather than as a result of a population that has persisted and built up over winter. And uh, Hugh and I discussed this earlier, and I think he was in agreement that that was the most likely scenario that the population would decline, and if there was a subsequent infestation, it would be as a result of immigration. So the next person we have to speak is Lisa Kelly, who is the pathologist based in Toowoomba and has been all around the country looking at soybeans and mung beans this year. So I was just going to give everyone a bit of an update on some of the fungal diseases that have been causing issues this uh, summer season. Um, so this picture here is a picture of fusarium wilt in mung beans. Fusarium wilt was quite widespread, particularly across southern Queensland on the downs. There was quite a lot of damage in quite a lot of paddocks this season. Fusarium wilt in mung beans, just to give you a bit of an overview of the disease itself, it's caused by the species Fusarium oxysporum and Fusarium solani. Both of those are species complexes, which basically means that as we look more at their taxonomy, we can probably split them into a whole number of species. So Fusarium solani alone, we think that they, it could probably be split into more than 60 different species these pathogens can be quite complex and vary quite a lot. They're also capable of surviving as endophytes, which means that they can survive within plants themselves without causing any disease symptoms. Uh, they can also be saprophytes, just living on the dead material. And as we know, they can also be plant pathogens. However, when they are plant pathogens, they do tend to be quite specific to their hosts. But this basically means that they're can be quite difficult to manage, seeing as they can survive in so many different ways. Now, over the last five or so years, we've been looking at how much fusarium's been in mung bean paddocks. We do find it in most paddocks that we look at, generally at a low incidence. So it might just be a scattered plant here or there at less than 5% of the crop. But that's something still to be wary of because it is a soil-borne pathogen and it does mean that it is surviving between seasons. And so as I mentioned, it was a pretty significant disease this summer. So the symptoms that you see with fusarium wilt, you get your typical wilting symptoms. However, sometimes you don't see those wilting symptoms. Sometimes the plants can just look a little bit unthrifty. It can be in scattered plants, but more or less it's generally across a larger patch of the paddock, more often than not on the edges of the paddock where it's a little bit more stressed. But what you do tend to find with all the fusarium wilt affected plants, they will have that distinctive root rot symptoms and that can develop into a basal rot sometimes. And as you split that stem open, it will have that vascular discoloration. So the browning of the vascular tissues. 
when plants, if they don't die, so if they do survive, they're often quite stunted and it can impact yields quite significantly. So over the last few years, we've seen that where there is a really high incidence of disease, there's also a really high yield loss. So this year it was quite abundant in many paddocks on the downs in particular. These two images just show you, I guess, two paddocks side by side. It just really uh, shows you the influence of plant stress on the disease. So these two paddocks uh, were both grown on the downs and were literally side by side. One is perfectly healthy, you don't see too many disease affected plants at all. And the other is virtually wiped out with fusarium. Now, the only real difference between these two paddocks is that the one that has disease, it was planted into really wet soil. It was planted probably a little deeper than they would have liked. Um, so right from the start, it's been a little bit more stressed and struggled to get out of the soil. And then also on top of that, they had some herbicide that had just been applied prior to that rain. Um, so you've just got that extra stress of getting the plants out of the soil and then the herbicide as well. Both of these paddocks have had similar paddock history. It's just purely come down to plant stress. So we know that these pathogens will survive in the soil for a number of years, but we're not sure how long they will survive. They will spread with the movement of soils, the movement of soil on your boots or machinery, or if water passes over your soil, it will spread it around as well. So as I mentioned, there's a strong association there with plant stress. And quite often you'll see that when we've had um, a particularly wet year. So in this case, we had a drought followed by a really wet start. We do tend to see it more in the heavier clay soils and that's probably because they hold that moisture a bit better. So in the last 12 months, I've ran some glasshouse experiments. Just to try and look at what other potential hosts these pathogens will survive in and whether any other hosts will become diseased from these pathogens. So I artificially inoculated barley, chickpea, cotton, soybean and sorghum. I couldn't uh, induce any disease symptoms in any of those crops. However, I did find that the pathogens did survive in the root system of each one of those crops, but to a lesser extent, the sorghum. So what that tells us is that these fusarium pathogens are capable of surviving between the cropping seasons in the roots of those other plants. Um, so that's something to really, really consider that they will survive between cropping seasons in those roots. And it shows us that to a lesser extent, it probably survives in sorghum. So perhaps that means that sorghum may be a better rotation choice if you've got um, fusarium wilt in your paddock. Uh, so we see a similar thing with the fusarium wilt pathogen in cotton, where it will survive in a whole number of hosts, but to a lesser extent, your sorghum and your maize. I'd really like to follow this up next season and just see whether this is what is actually happening out in the paddock. Over the last couple of years, I've been screening mung bean germplasm. So jade and your crystal, the two most commonly grown cultivars are both pretty susceptible. But what I did find is the two black gram cultivars, Onyx and Riga, as well as your Solera 2 and your Satin, they seem to have some tolerance to these diseases. So crop rotation will be pretty important. However, there's a lot that we don't understand about crop rotation at this stage. So with the cotton fusarium pathogen, we know that it has a wide host range, but it does build up in the soil with some hosts more than others. With the cotton fusarium, it also benefits if we have a fallow within the system, cropping rotation. If that's not always an option, then how you manage that sub stubble could be something to consider. Because it's primarily soil-borne disease, avoiding planting mung beans on mung beans um, is really important, particularly if it's within that three years. And something else that we've been working on is whether there's a relationship there with nematodes. So with your fusarium pathogens in overseas, they've been able to show that sometimes fusarium wilt is worse when there's nematodes there as well. So this year we had a, just a glasshouse experiment trying to look at whether there is an interaction there with the root lesion nematode, which is uh, the Pratolinchus thordii. So what we found was that the plant heights and pod numbers were reduced when fusarium wilt occurred in the presence of Pratolinchus thordii. So that might be something else to consider. So if you know that your paddock does have a high, high populations of Pratolinchus thordii, perhaps then it may be more at risk of developing fusarium wilt. I'll just move on to um, soybean now. So target spot and anthracnose were two fungal diseases which caused some pretty significant damage in the Burdekin region this season. 
back in early March this year in the cultivar A6785. Um, in the Burdekin, Hugh and I were receiving a whole lot of phone calls about plants dying pretty rapidly, losing their leaves, and they didn't really know what was causing the problem. Hugh and I went up and had a look at a number of crops and what we found was that there was a lot of soybean stem fly in a lot of the crops that we saw, as well as the target spot and anthracnose diseases. Um, so what we thought was that it's probably primarily the fungal diseases that have caused uh, a lot of the symptoms that we're seeing. Growers were seeing some of these leaf spots. So in that image, the leaf spot that you can see there is pretty typical of the target spot pathogen. But both of the anthracnose and target spot pathogen will cause lesions on the pods, the stems, and um, can result in leaf defoliation and plant death. We think they really like the warm, wet weather, which is what the Burdekin area really experienced earlier this year. So it was probably just a really ideal environment to get these pathogens infecting plants and then spreading pretty rapidly. Both of these pathogens are seed borne and will survive in the crop residues. So it's something that growers will really need to consider before planting soybeans again next season. There will be quite a lot of disease inoculum around. So how they um, manage this disease will be pretty important. Both of these pathogens will spread by the soil, rain splash and wind as well. I've just got a couple of images there, just some images of the anthracnose pathogen on the pods. Um, so if you zoom in and have a look at the second image, which is just on the microscope, it really shows you the fungal fruiting bodies that are present on the pod surface. So how to best manage these diseases? We know that they're going to be seed borne, so it's really important to avoid sowing seed from affected crops this season. It's also a good idea to avoid planting soybeans back into a paddock that's previously had these diseases or even um, in a paddock nearby where perhaps if you have some crop residues or something could potentially blow over and infect that newly planted crop. And the literature seems to think at least two years break in those paddocks where you've had the disease before. And that's really about giving time for that inoculum to break down in those crop residues and in the soil. Another thing to consider is how you manage those crop residues. So whether that's burying those crop residues or burning them. Crop rotation is another thing to consider. So it's really important not to plant soybean on soybean or even soybean on mung bean. It's really important to rotate those with your non-host. Again, just to break down that disease inoculum from building up even more. Your corn, grain, sorghum or sugarcane won't host those uh, two pathogens. Controlling your weeds and volunteer soybeans will be another important factor. And then you can do things such as considering your agronomic practices to really avoid reproducing that wet, humid environment that these pathogens will favour. So something like planting at a lower seed rate or in wider roads to encourage airflow through the crop, just so it's not so humid and wet. And then avoiding excess and overhead irrigation is something else to consider. Now this season we didn't have any fungicides under permit or registered to control these diseases. However, just in the last couple of weeks, there's been an emergency permit go out for the use of the Veritas fungicide against the anthracnose pathogen. So if you do see this disease again next season, you will have an added fungicide there as well. Uh, so that's all I had to say. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, so Lisa, uh, Hugh Reed and Smith, I'm just wondering about those varieties that have got some tolerance to fusarium, how much tolerance? I guess at the moment it's a bit hard to quantify because all I've been doing is glasshouse experiments which are quite difficult to do with soil-borne pathogens. What I'm seeing in the glasshouse, you know, I'd really like to run some field trials and um, really just confirm that's what's happening in, in the field. But as far as in the glasshouse goes, they can be infected by fusarium but uh, to a much lesser extent. So they take a lot longer to be infected and then there's a lot less root rot there. So Lisa, was there any evidence with the anthracnose and uh, target spot in the burdekin that it came in on seed that growers bought? I'm still testing the seed that they originally planted with, but the more I speak to growers and agronomists from that area, it sounds like that these diseases have probably been there for a number of seasons and just at a lower incidence or gone unnoticed. 
it's likely that they probably have been around and just the environment this season was really conducive for the disease to take off. Lisa, Graham Harris here. Just looking at the north, has there been fusarium turning up at all in monk bean crops in the Burdekin? Uh, I haven't heard of any fusarium in the Burdekin. Okay, no, that's good to know. Yeah, we haven't seen them in Georgetown yet, but we'll keep an eye out. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Now, the last presentation is me, but before we get to that, I wanted to just deal with the very last question that came in through registration, which was about Helicoverpa punctifera or Heliothus punctifera moths that were abundant in sorghum in the Moree area this last summer. And the questions are around whether sorghum is a suitable crop for punctifera infestations. I guess asking the question whether this is something that we might see more often. And if not, then what are the preferred hosts and uh, and various crops. So here's just a little bit for those of you who aren't familiar with Heliopus punctifera. Like it's very closely related, obviously, to the Helicoverpa species we're more familiar with. A little bit different in terms of the, the larvae, and the moths are quite similar to Helicoverpa moths with that sort of coloured variation in the adults between males and females as well. And you can see in the literature there's quite a wide host range that includes pulses and various other things. The records for crops are quite limited or extensive depending on your view. So cotton, loosen, wheat and maize have all been identified as crops that they have been found in. And then in the south where punctifera tends to be a more frequent spring visitor, pulses, medics, canola and cereals have all got records for punctifera occurrences. So whether the sorghum is likely to be a regular host, we don't know. And I guess that's something that's well worth keeping an eye on over time. And, it, and it's possible that it has been there and we just haven't noticed it. I'll just move on because what I was asked to do today was really just sort of cover quickly fall army worm and just to provide you with a little bit of an update of where it is and what sort of experiences people are having with it. So this is the, the current map of distribution which includes a predominantly uh, occurrences in Queensland. The black dots are sites where we have traps but have not yet detected them. The orange sites, importantly, are where we have found infestations of larvae as well as detections in moths. And you can see that some of these ones in Western Australia perhaps unconfirmed at this point, but certainly moths and some unconfirmed records of larvae over there, but confirmation in both the Northern Territory and in the Ord of larvae in crops, uh, specifically maize and forage sorghum in that instance. So as we kind of expected very much at this point, a tropical pest and the big question is really about the distribution next summer and whether we're going to see much migration south and what threat that poses, particularly to some of those late summer crops that might still be in the ground. If you're interested in what sort of numbers are being caught, this is a map that just shows a cumulative catch through to early May. And you can see on the left hand side, the legend that shows you sort of quantum of those catches to date. And you can see that so far the numbers are still relatively low. What we have seen is that where traps are catching moths, they may continue to catch moths or they may not. And the big movement through 19th to 16th of April through central Queensland, not all those traps have continued to catch fall armyworm reliably. So it's likely that that was a movement of moths, not necessarily resulting in ongoing populations in those areas, perhaps because there haven't been in crops. But what you will see, I guess, on this map is how busy it is here and as you get warmer. These are records for Bowen. And over the last couple of weeks, the numbers of moths being caught and the density of larvae and crops in that Bowen Burdekin area is on the increase. Many of you may have seen some of the information on Twitter and various other places. Brent Wilson is one of the agronomists who is particularly sort of interested and active in this space and he, he's been putting up information and we've been in, in sort of regular contact with him. At this point, in addition to maize where the damage seems to be most severe, sorghum is hosting populations which haven't resulted in damage so far. And there's also some superficial damage being observed in some of the pulse crops, so in soybeans and now in chickpeas, which it's a little bit unclear. Certainly in the soybeans didn't result in any significant crop loss or damage to the reproductive crops, but just leaf feeding. So the one thing to say is that the populations that are being seen in the north at this point are low by international standards, so well below the sort of thresholds that they use in North America, for example. So 
I guess what that suggests, as well as the experience now of building populations, is that it is a, a recent incursion and that we can expect to see uh, if things are suitable, populations build over time. The identification of the larvae is not as easy as we had hoped. It's actually very similar to a number of other caterpillar pests that we're familiar with, both the suite of army worms as well as Helicoverpa. As they, the larvae get bigger, it's much easier to identify them. When we had a webinar with Brent Wilson recently, his suggestion was if you're finding larvae that you're uncertain about, put them into something with some leaf material to feed on and it becomes much more easily identifiable once you, you sort of go through that process a few times. What I wanted to do here is just to show you that it's not a monster of an animal. It's really no bigger than Helicoverpa. There's a big jump between the small larvae and the medium, very sudden, not, not as gradual as with Helicoverpa. But in the last instars, certainly looks much fatter and greasier, a lot more like a cutworm than we would be used to with Helicoverpa. These are some of the things that are being seen, the egg masses, which you'd be familiar with if you're familiar with cluster caterpillar, and the windowing by the early instar larvae. And you can see there the larvae in situ. Patchiness, particularly at low density, as a result of distribution from those egg masses is quite typical. At higher densities, like they're seeing now, it's fairly well every plant infested. And these are just some images of the sort of damage that we saw when we went to North Queensland and had a look at the infestations in corn. One of the things that is happening in those crops is rather than just the shot holing that we're familiar with in sorghum and corn from Helicoverpa and other armyworm species, they cause so much damage to the world that those perforations result in large chunks of leaf falling off. So it's a much more significant loss of leaf area, but I guess it remains to be seen in our local conditions and in the various growing areas. And I guess irrigation and dry land may well be different as well. What impact that has ultimately on growth rates and yield. So there's a bit of work to be done there. And it's important, this is a really important point that now we're all on sort of high alert for fall armyworm, that there are other species that cause similar damage. And it's important to check, don't assume that it's fall armyworm because all these pictures were taken on the downs in irrigated corn and none of them are fall armyworm, but the damage looks extremely similar to fall armyworm. And particularly under the high pressure we saw this year, that, that picture on the top left is very much like the damage you see with fall armyworm because they are typically there in multiple larvae per plant rather than just the one helicoverpa that we're used to seeing. So that remains an important point. Encouragingly, we're seeing natural enemies already attacking fall armyworm. And I guess because it's not a very big jump from the other noctured caterpillars to fall armyworm, we would expect to see that continue. And hopefully, if we're able to use insecticides judiciously, that will become a very important part of the management of fall armyworm. To some extent, we're lucky to have a whole suite of permits now available, particularly for maize, for sorghum, Outer core is not available under permit. It's very important to check at the APVMA if you are going to control full armyworm, what's available. As of the 21st of May, there are 31 products, not all for grains, of course, but grains is quite well catered for, particularly for those highly susceptible maize crops. So just quickly, uh, thresholds. One of the things that you will uh, notice here is that there are no thresholds for winter cereals, there's some concern about whether fall armyworm posed a risk to early planted winter cereals. I could find no reference to winter cereals being affected by fall armyworm and it remains to be seen whether there are some seasons where conditions are conducive to that occurring. A lot of what we will focus our attention on will come as a result of experience. Pheromone traps, if you're thinking about getting one, it's quite challenging to use. It's not like Helicoverpa where you just get Helicoverpa. We're getting a lot of bycatch, particularly of this false armyworm species, the Lucania species, which makes it really quite challenging to determine whether you do have fall armyworm there at the bottom of the trap. And we've been looking at different ways to try and improve that so that it becomes a much more viable tool for industry. There's been a huge amount of investment in fall armyworm monitoring overseas, which suggests that it may well be a useful tool for monitoring activity locally, if not in nearby crops. If you need help, with identification or you think that you have found fall armyworm, here is a list of your local entomologists in Queensland to contact by email or phone, send a text with a picture. We're getting lots of pictures of 
Helicoverpa, but don't stop sending them because at some point someone will find one further south of, of Emerald and Illawarra. Uh, the beak sheet has uh, quite a bit of information. We're, we're sort of adding to that all the time. And there's a recording of the update, the discussion and the Q&A session that we had with Brent Wilson. This session is being recorded, so that will go up there too. And then anything else that we develop that we think will be of use in detecting and managing fall armyworm will be going up on the beach sheet and, and various other places. There's also information on the Queensland Government page and there's the URL for that. So I think that that is just a very quick overview and I'm more than happy to take any questions on fall armyworm if you have them. Uh, Melina, Patrick Press here. Um, I had a phone call today from a West Australian colleague we had a phone call from a farmer in Derby with 800 per square metre, apparently, and he'd already put Trojan and Alpha Cypermethrin on it. So I was wondering, have you heard anything from your colleagues within the D uh, Department of Ag? In our conversations with Deep Herd, they've heard similar. But the point where we spoke to them a couple of weeks ago, no one had actually gone to have a look or seen <laughs> specimens from those locations. And, you know, anybody who's been out and swept a bit of pasture or, or um, you know, hay crop or anything like that this year knows that there are abundant armyworm species. So I'm quite suspicious that those are not mm. fall armyworm. If there are some fall armyworm there, that might be to be expected. But I doubt that there are 800 per square metre fall armyworm. That sounds very much more like the density of armyworms that we saw when we went to Georgetown looking for fall armyworm in the early days. There was that sort of density in the grasses around the paddock. So that wouldn't surprise me, but it would if it were fall armyworm, sure. Uh, this guy was growing sorghum and rhodes grass, I think. So that would possibly explain it being a rhodes grass crop. Yes, there are definitely reports of fall armyworm or armyworms in rhodes grass, particularly rhodes grass grown for seed, where I guess it's there for a, a reasonably long time. There was a question earlier, I'll just pop that in about fall armyworm and BT, the known tolerance of Spodoptera to BT and a question about whether fall armyworm is likely to be susceptible. It's one of the big questions and I know that CSIRO is looking at that right now. Overseas experience has shown quite widespread resistance to BTs, a whole range of prize. The only one that I'm aware of and talking to CSIRO that they think may work is products that contain Cry1F. But I think that all the questions about whether fall armyworm is resistant or tolerant or susceptible to different products is under investigation by CSIRO and it will be eagerly awaited because, you know, the management of resistance for fall armyworm, the, the selection of products is highly dependent on what the incursion has brought with it in terms of resistance. And it's quite likely that there will be quite significant resistance to some groups of products. Um, Melina here, Redden Smith. Just wondered, would you expect next summer that we would see fall armyworm getting down onto the downs? I think it's possible, Hugh. The timing is a little bit more uncertain. I think that if it's a good season in the north and that the populations build up, that it is likely. And I guess I, I would see that perhaps some of those later sorghum crops might be places that we would see them turn up. There's a bit of a debate about whether the timing will be sort of from December onwards or whether it will be, you know, February onwards. But yeah, look, I think it's entirely possible given good conditions for build up of populations in the north and weather systems that facilitate that southward movement. Thanks. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'd be very interested if this sort of session online, uh, even when we can get back together, is of any use. And if we were to do face to face workshops when we can, if there are particular topics that you're interested in. So I just wanted to thank you all for taking part, to thank you, Lisa and Zaritza, for their presentations. And please send your fall armyworm suspects and continue to make contact about issues with management. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>